Well, week nine, part A. Once again, it's a, it's a large body of knowledge, Earth's space science. So this week we've actually split it into two sections. Um, and the first one, obviously, Loxley, Loxley deals with in uh, chapter 10 of the text. Um, so really do read Loxley carefully here because, um, you know, they, they've got lots of great ideas on breaking this vast amount of knowledge down into something that's quite workable. I notice you'll also be chipping away in the background on assessment task number two. So this presentation is going to try and talk as much as possible about, about assessment task number two um, and make links where possible to help you with your understanding of what's required for that task. So here we go. The introduction. Now Loxley chapter 10. And we're focusing this week on Earth and space sciences as the substrands and the understanding strand of the ACS. So we're grouping them together in that format. Loxley's pretty good on chapter 10 on Earth science and takes us back and looks at some of the, the key concepts. The challenge here really is, is you know, how to link it to assessment task number two. And there's lots of good resources out there um, and lots of things that you're going to be able to do. We'll talk about some of that as we get going. Our goals outline the theories rel related to the history of the universe, and there's many of them. Identify the structures within our solar system, describe the phases of the moon, and explain the seasons and eclipses in terms of the position of the moon, earth, and sun. Now, Loxley actually do um, you know, three and four quite well. Um, I'm going to focus mostly on points one and two um, and develop a little bit of an approach as to how you may go about um, uh, using approaches one and two um, to develop some units. So when we look at Earth, um, what can we say? Numbers paint a fabulous picture when you're doing an introduction. Clearly you've got to try and get the students engaged and you've got to try and get them tuning in um, to what's going on here. So when we look at this, Earth is just one of nine planets. The sun is a star. Build their learning hierarchies. Stars cluster to form galaxies. So what we're doing here is we're creating a language, we're creating you know, a, a lexical framework in which students can relate to the stars. And we can relate as a group, so it's a common language. Our sun is one of over three million stars in the Milky Way. What is the Milky Way? Oh, it's a galaxy. It's one of over 100 billion galaxies in the visible universe. These all look like stars to us. That's what a star is. Our solar system is on the edge of a spiral arm in the Milky Way. It rotates around the centre of the galaxy once every 250 million years. So that's how, our, that's how large this is. I mean, think about the awe, you know, the wonder in that. You know, how big a number is that? And of course, at any given time, right now, um, the Earth is spinning you know, up here in the north. We're, we're spinning about 1,000 kilometres an hour um, a, a around the sun. Added to that, of course, is our solar system. The Milky Way is spinning an additional 200 kilometres around our galaxy. So at any given point in time, you may not feel like it, but the miracle of gravity has got you sitting there with your hair looking absolutely lovely, even though you're moving at 1,200 kilometres per hour. Isn't science amazing? Can't we do something with that in terms of our learners? The origins of the universe is again another opportunity for an engagement hook. Now think about assessment task number two you are meant to actually produce uh, an engaging unit, an engaging unit that links students to independent learning. This is what the digital card is all about. It's a surrogate for the teacher. Now, in this week's Zoom session, I'm going to talk about this notion of flipping the classroom. Why do you flip a classroom? Flipping the classroom basically means turning it from a teacher-led to a student-centred classroom. Now, technology is one of our big tools there. A teacher will use technology will point her students towards technological resources and repositories to free up more time in the classroom. Think about it. If students can actually sit down and get a, you know, a, a direct in instruction around a scientific concept or you know, the outline, for instance, of the universe or the sequence of the planets, if students can get that online or through a simulation, then this is time in the classroom that the teacher can spend developing working, reworking, rechecking and building those concepts. So it's what Vygotsky would say, you know, really you know, heavy ZPD work where the student is sitting down and you're working with the student's concepts. You go from instead of constructing as a teacher and directing and instructing, you instantly engage in the task of reconstruction with the student because they already have the basic concepts. The concepts may not be correctly lined up, but that's what a good teacher does. They deconstruct the student's framework and help them to reconstruct it in a way that is much more relevant um, to knowledge frameworks. 
So we're going to take them on a philosophical tour de force, and that's what your digital card is supposed to be. Now when we look at the origins of the universe, there are many perspectives on this. Ancient Egypt, you know, the, the, the whole notion of the god Ra, the watery abyss created Ra, Ra came out of the water. Think of science, the Big Bang Theory, where did the single cell amoeba come from? It came from the water. Similarities. Ra created everything else. He blew the first air, he spat the first moisture. And of course, when Ra cried, humans were created. It's a mythology, but we can see it's also a scientific perspective. The Judeo-Christian perspective, God created heaven and earth six days. It's the fabulous thing about the Christian philosophy. Everything happens on a certain day and nothing else happened on that day. You know, on the first day, on the second day, on the third day, and on the seventh day, he rested. It's all there in Genesis. God created light, oceans, land, plant, animals, and humans. Interestingly, humans in his own likeness. So if we had a little bit of an evolutionary perspective in the Bible, um, it's based on a hierarchy. Okay, that we are created in the likeness of the, the God. Okay, or the Godhead or the God figure. Ironically, we're the only species that elevates ourselves as a result above our environment. Now, some people point to that being problematic. And of course, as ACDC once proudly sung, let there be light. Okay, it's actually a biblical term. Most of you would know that. Um, and it comes from that, that concept of Genesis and the, and the con conception into today a Christian world. Science has got the Big Bang Theory. The Big Bang Theory wasn't the only scientific theory. There's also the steady state theory. Now, the steady state theory actually lacked evidence. And as a result, it was tossed out. The Big Bang Theory had evidence, and we're going to explore how and why that happened today. And in doing so, I'm hopefully going to give you a little bit of a learner's framework um, that you can actually use to develop um, with your students. And I'll talk about assessment task two as part of that model and process. Right, moving right along. Now, science also has its own framework. Um, and we can go back also to the, the Incas, um, an ancient society, you know, first civilization. Even they had a pseudo-evolutionary perspective on science and, and, and on the planets. Earth was a dark place, and from that dark place, of course, Contiki emerged out of a lake. Again, note the water theme, very common, bringing the first humans with him, okay, a small group of people, but the first. He then made the sun, the moon, the stars. He made the humans out of large rocks, um, but humans weren't grateful enough, they weren't thankful enough, they weren't indebted enough to their god, Contiki. So he punished them with a paralyzing drought. Now we know in the Judeo-Christian sense it was a flood. You know, there's all kinds of you know, acts of God, gods of wrath and, and, and anger. Another god objected to this and drove Contiki out from society and community and turned all of Contiki's followers into monkeys. Hence, these were our ancestors and the concept of, of evolution. So think about assessment task number two. Even though we're looking at um, the evolution and, and theories of, of the, the origins of society and, and also of, of Earth and the universe, think about what possibilities exist for an inquiry approach because this is the ACS. This is what we're required to do for assessment task number two. So at this stage, I'm going to identify, uh, introduce you to David Christian. Now, David Christian does this 18-minute um, history of the universe. Now, read this, uh, well, read, follow, in, in conjunction with the work in Loxley, because David Christian presents a brilliant video, and he poses the question of, where did this all start? And he goes back 13.7 billion years ago, and starts off, of course, with the Big Bang, and what instantly follows the Big Bang. And of course, you know, it's a, a fraction of a second after the Big Bang, the Earth cools at the point of cooling, the first molecule forms, the first molecule then is so hot and explosive, it ignites, and that first molecule, the explosion of that first molecule, set in chain the ripple of the Big Bang. I think David Christian tells it much better than I can. Have a listen. Back 13.7 billion years to the beginning of time. Around us, there's nothing. There's not even time or space. Imagine the darkest, emptiest thing you can, and cube it a gazillion times, and that's where we are. And then suddenly, bam! 
A universe appears, an entire universe, and we've crossed our first threshold. The universe is tiny, it's smaller than an atom, it's incredibly hot, it contains everything that's in today's universe, so you can imagine, it's busting, and it's expanding at incredible speed. And at first it's just a blur, but very quickly distinct things begin to appear in that blur. Within the first second, energy itself shatters into distinct forces, including electromagnetism and gravity. And energy does something else quite magical. It congeals to form matter. Quarks that will create protons and leptons that include electrons. And all of that happens in the first second. Now we move forward 380,000 years. That's twice as long as humans have been on this planet. And now simple atoms appear of hydrogen and helium. Now, I want to pause for a moment, 380,000 years after the origins of the universe, because we actually know quite a lot about the universe at this stage. We know, above all, that it was extremely simple. It consisted of huge clouds of hydrogen and helium atoms, and they have no structure. They're, they're really a sort of cosmic mush. But that's not completely true. Recent studies by satellites such as the WMAP satellite have shown that, in fact, there are just tiny differences in that background. What you see here, the blue areas are about a thousandth of a degree cooler than the red areas. These are tiny differences, but it was enough for the universe to move on to the next stage of building complexity, and this is how it works. Gravity is more powerful where there's more stuff. So where you get slightly denser areas, gravity starts compacting clouds of hydrogen and helium atoms. So we can imagine the early universe breaking up into a billion clouds. And each cloud is compacted, gravity gets more powerful as density increases, the temperature begins to rise at the center of each cloud, and then at the center of each cloud the temperature crosses the threshold temperature of 10 million degrees, protons start to fuse, there's a huge release of energy, and... Bam! We have our first stars. From about 200 million years after the Big Bang, stars begin to appear all through the universe, billions of them. And the universe is now significantly more interesting and more complex. Stars will create the Goldilocks conditions for crossing two new thresholds. When very large stars die, they create temperatures so high that protons begin to fuse in all sorts of exotic combinations to form all the elements of the periodic table. If, like me, you're wearing a gold ring, it was forged in a supernova explosion. So now the universe is chemically more complex. And in a chemically more complex universe, it's possible to make more things. And what starts happening is that around young suns, young stars, all these elements combine, they swirl around, the energy of the star stirs them around, they form particles, they form snowflakes, they form little dust motes, they form rocks, they form asteroids, and eventually they form planets and moons. And that is how our solar system was formed four and a half billion years ago. Fascinating stuff, isn't it? Now, um, David Christian here is giving us a summary of the evolution of the universe. Now, as a teacher, yeah, it's really important that you're grounded in this. Not that you know it as well as he does, not that you can recite the figures he does, but simple principles, understanding what mainstream science argues, and what also what and why mainstream science supports this. He continues to talk about threshold four, where planets create, you know, he go, talks about the evolution of the Earth in six threshold steps, which again is good scaffolding if you're going to use it for your teaching. Rocky planets like our Earth are significantly more complex than stars because they contain a much greater diversity of materials. So we've crossed a fourth threshold of complexity. Now, the going gets tougher. The next stage introduces entities that are significantly more fragile, significantly more vulnerable, but they're also much more creative and much more capable of generating further complexity. I'm talking, of course, about living organisms. Living organisms are created by chemistry. We are huge packages of chemicals. So chemistry is dominated by the electromagnetic force. That operates over smaller scales than gravity, which explains why you and I are smaller than stars or planets. Now, what are the ideal conditions for chemistry? What are the Goldilocks conditions? Well, first, 
you need energy. But not too much. In the center of a star, there's so much energy that any atoms that combine will just get busted apart again. But not too little. In intergalactic space, there's so little energy that atoms can't combine. What you want is just the right amount. And planets, it turns out, are just right because they're close to stars, but not too close. You also need a great diversity of chemical elements and you need liquids, such as water. Why? Well, in gases, atoms move past each other so fast that they can't hitch up. In solids, atoms are stuck together. They can't move. In liquids, they can cruise and cuddle and link up to form molecules. Now, where do you find such Goldilocks conditions? Well, planets are great, and our early Earth was almost perfect. It was just the right distance from its star to contain huge oceans of liquid water. And deep beneath those oceans, at cracks in the Earth's crust, you got heat seeping up from inside the Earth, and you got a great diversity of elements. So at those deep oceanic vents, fantastic chemistry began to happen, and atoms combined in all sorts of exotic combinations. But of course, life is more than just exotic chemistry. How do you stabilize those huge molecules that seem to be viable? Well, it's here that life introduces an entirely new trick. You don't stabilize the individual, you stabilize the template, the thing that carries information, and you allow the template to copy itself. And DNA, of course, is the beautiful molecule that contains that information. You'll be familiar with the double helix of DNA. Each rung contains information. So DNA contains information about how to make living organisms. And DNA also copies itself. So it copies itself and scatters the templates through the ocean. So the information spreads. Notice that information has become part of our story. The real beauty of DNA, though, is in its imperfections. As it copies itself, once in every billion runs, there tends to be an error. And what that means is that DNA is, in effect, learning. It's accumulating new ways of making living organisms because some of those errors work. So DNA is learning, and it's building greater diversity and greater complexity. And we can see this happening over the last four billion years. For most of that time of life on Earth, living organisms have been relatively simple, single cells, but they had great diversity and inside great complexity. Then from about 600 to 800 million years ago, multi-celled organisms appear. You get fungi, you get fish, you get plants, you get amphibia, you get reptiles, and then of course you get the dinosaurs. And occasionally there are disasters. 65 million years ago, an asteroid landed on Earth near the Yucatan Peninsula, creating conditions equivalent to those of a nuclear war. And the dinosaurs are wiped out. Terrible news for the dinosaurs, but great news for our mammalian ancestors, who flourished in the niches left empty by the dinosaurs. And we human beings are part of that creative evolutionary pulse that began 65 million years ago with the landing of an asteroid. Fascinating history, isn't it? So when we look at um, David Christian's story, he's moving us through the evolution of the Earth, um, through the, the evolution of space science, and making that really vital connection to the environment. And this is really what we're required to do as teachers in the teaching of Earth and space sciences. We're going to continue with this discussion of the emergence of life. There's only a, about a minute uh, associated with this. But again, he makes some very, very good points. And the reason why I offer this is because he is throwing out all of these really fascinating hooks. All of these are enticing hooks, little artifacts that you can use to, you know, to engage your students. And around this engagement, you can build and scaffold some really rich digital cards. Right. Humans appeared about 200,000 years ago. And I believe we count as a threshold in this great story. Let me explain why. We've seen that DNA learns, in a sense. It accumulates information, but it is so slow. DNA accumulates information through random errors that just, some of which just happen to work. 
But DNA had actually generated a faster way of learning. It had produced organisms with brains. And those organisms can learn in real time. They accumulate information. They learn. The sad thing is, when they die, the information dies with them. Now, what makes humans different is human language. We are blessed with a language, a system of communication so powerful and so precise that we can share what we've learned with such precision that it can accumulate in the collective memory. And that means it can outlast the individuals who learnt that information and it can accumulate from generation to generation. And that's why as a species we are so creative and so powerful and that's why we have a history. Fascinating point again. The accumulation of knowledge and with the brain, of course, the brain span that we've, we've learned to develop, we still utilise um, you know, less than, than 15 or 18 percent of our brain. So there's a lot of space to grow um, there. And, and of course, as our environment adapts and we need to adapt to it, um, you know, we've seen our frontal lobe, for instance, um, grow at, 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 you know, at, at a tremendous rate uh, as a species. And again, that had to do around about the time when, when we you know, stepped up from all fours onto, onto two legs literally when we came down to a tree and we started to engage our environment in a different way. And of course, you know, neuroplasticity, our brain altered in the way that, that our environment challenged it to grow. So David uh, Christian is presenting you here some incredible insights, language. You know, look at all of these avenues you have to bring into this particular subject. His next point and his final one minute. We, it's what makes us different. We can see it at work in the earliest stages of human history. We evolved as a species in the savanna lands of Africa. But then you see humans migrating into new environments, into desert lands, into jungles, into the ice age tundra of Siberia. Tough, tough environment. Into the Americas, into Australasia. Each migration involved learning, learning new ways of exploiting the environment, new ways of dealing with their surroundings. Then 10,000 years ago, exploiting a sudden change in global climates with the end of the last ice age, humans learned to farm. Farming was an energy bonanza, and exploiting that energy, human populations multiplied, human societies got larger, denser, more interconnected. And then, from about 500 years ago, humans began to link up globally through shipping, through trains, through telegraph, through the internet, until now we seem to form a single global brain of almost 7 billion individuals, and that brain is learning at warp speed. Fascinating stuff. So David Christian has done all our heavy lifting here. As teachers, he's made the connection between space, earth, environment, between human beings, evolution, and of course, this, this thing that links us together in the modern world. Now, let's take a learner perspective. Let's assume, for instance, that we are here and we are going to run and develop a unit for our learners. Okay. Assessment task two requires you to come up with a table. On that table, you are required, for instance, to come through with some ideas on how you're going to deliver your particular digital card, how you're going to time your lesson sequence, and how much you'll do that for. This little example is an example, for instance, just, just to demonstrate a little bit about what assessment task two involves. So this is a hypothetical lesson sequence. Now, I'm not adding any um, um, ICT connections in there. That's your job to do in your assessment item. What I'm doing is pointing to the opportunity to do this. So this is, you know, the Big Bang Theory. A little lesson activity is a sequence of lessons on the Big Bang Theory. This is my, my intention, my pedagogical intent. Okay, and in delivering this pedagogical intent, here are some of the things I would do. For instance, for my learners, I would commence with the first task, um, which would be very much a, a, um, a very simple task, a word search on what we may have learned um, leading up to and starting this particular unit. Now, a word search can be a very simple document and it can look something pretty much like this. There we've got some key words there. Now, the students and learners, this is obviously an upper primary unit. The learners would have actually been through some of these concepts and we would have done some you know, definitional work or discussion work or some introductory work so that we're actually creating a common language. A really important point, having that common language. So once we've got that, uh, that under task, we can then complete the word search and we can start to get into our little unit. Now what is my intent? 
Okay, the start is going to be the word search. We're exploring the evidence for the Big Bang Theory. We've got our keywords, CMBR, Redshift, Nobel Prize, Steady State. And what we're trying to do is structure some learning here. So here's our intent. All students will state the two main pieces of evidence for the Big Bang Theory. Most students should be able to explain CMBR and Redshift how, and how they provide evidence for the Big Bang Theory. And some students will actually be capable of, of evaluating the Big Bang Theory. And of course, we're going to use our classroom dynamics to work with those students. We're going to flip the classroom so those students become you know, learning leaders within their groups so that we can then develop the rest of the learners and bring those learners along and their continuum as far as we possibly can. So an inquiry process. Assessment task two requires you to, to, to engage in inquiry methods. The ACS requires inquiry methods. Now inquiry learning is, is a broad based um, umbrella. It's an umbrella term. So in assessment task two, don't just say I'm using inquiry learning. Break it down. What are you doing? Are you doing narrative? Are you building models? What exactly is it you're doing? Are you doing problem based learning? Are you doing the five E's? Are you doing POE? Let us know. Tell us what it is. In this case, we're looking at cosmic microwave background radiation. CMBR. Now during the Big Bang, huge amounts of radiation would have been created and thrown out across the universe. You know, this single atom exploding at quantum rates. However, when we look out into space, space looks pretty quiet. It's devoid of activity and usually devoid of energy, though the amount of space junk, another topic you may want to look at, is increasing dramatically. So where has all the energy gone? Or is the energy simply in a form that we can't see it? Cosmic microwave background radiation was the search for leftover energy and in the 1950s and 60s this is a science story so lots of opportunities to hook your learners in there's scientists everywhere were searching this in the end it became the subject of a Nobel Prize and believe it or not it was two university students that eventually found the source now what we've got here is a little bit of a background sheet and it takes you back to the 60s where you know just a one-page history of, of two university students, um, Penzias and Wilson, um, and they had you know, this really interesting notion of an abandoned uh, Bell Lab um, antenna. They tried to repurpose the antenna for re research purposes. Um, unfortunately, they had pigeons shitting in the antenna. So they got a gun and they killed the pigeons, and then they put their, their test. But still, no matter what they did, they were getting space noise. And they couldn't work out what the space noise was. In the end, when they completed their research, of course, it was Nobel Prize winning uh, research, the space noise was actually cosmic microwave activity. So fascinating science, really, really worth exploring and worth looking at. Um, but when we look at this, for instance, let's have a look at, at, at how this unit would pan out from a learner's perspective, what you could do with it. Now, if I was teaching this, I'd break my students into a group. The whole purpose of flipping the classroom is that you can get round and be in the meddler in the middle. You can do a lot more with your students if you've given them an online task. So they've gone into your digital card they're starting to get into their groups and they're reading through this introduction on radi radiation. So you give the groups of five each a role. One is an analyst, someone who's going to actually look up the research, look up the terms and identify what the terms mean. One is a reporter who's going to report back to the group. One is a scribe who's going to keep all the important notes. One is a timekeeper who's going to actually facilitate and move the group along. And one is a noise monitor. Not so much the volume of noise, but to make sure that the noise is productive, that the noise actually is not background noise, but is foreground learning noise. So in a simple group structure like this, you've got yourself a research team. The jigsaw task, six questions, sorry, five questions. Okay. Um, read the information on the discovery of the cosmic microwave background and answer the questions below. And so the questions asked, some of them are quite straightforward. Again, you scaffold your questions, so some are achievable, some are within reach. And the whole aim is to get the group working together, to get them forming their roles and get them to storm and, and run their activities. So what was the name of the two scientists? That becomes pretty easy. What was C CMBR causing the two scientists ones removed? So they actually start to understand some of the processes. What did the scientists think would be causing the static? Okay, the poor pigeons. And what was the reaction of Robert Dick when he learned what Penzias and Wilson had discovered? And ultimately, who got the Nobel Prize? Now, a story within a story within a story. The science is rich, the opportunity to learn is huge. 
Now we know that C CMBR is, is the leftover radiation from the start of the universe. When we had all that explosion, we heard David Christian talk about different heat levels. You know, some radiation is you know one thousandth of a degree hotter than others. So it's not blank noise. It's actually a series of different, different gases, different processes of different temperatures. Hence, they're creating a wall of noise, which in, you know impacts. And, and can be heard here on Earth. Now, it can only be explained by the Big Bang Theory and the discovery made the theory more widely accepted. One of the questions you're going to want to ask your students is why? What does that prove? Spotlight? Okay, the reporter. When you get a spotlight task, the reporter in the group has got to rise to the challenge of the spotlight. Everyone in the group, of course, is recording their findings, but the reporter is the person who reports back to the class at large, to the sharing stage. So what have we got? We've got a jigsaw task. What does the Big Bang Theory state? Question one. What is redshift? Question two. How does the redshift provide evidence for the Big Bang? Question three. What does CMBR stand for? Question four. Who were the two scientists? Question five. And how does CMBR provide evidence for the Big Bang Theory of the Universe? Students are in their groups. They're working together. Every group is working together on the same six questions at their own pace and you as the teacher are moving between them. You've put a lot of resources online in your digital card so they can go there and check their understandings. And they're working in groups, they're self-paced, and you'll find that they're working independently. You can now move around. You have flipped the classroom. You are free to move around and work pedagogically and strategically with your students. The next task for you as a teacher, of course, is to have pretty quick feedback. So you've got to have feedback for your spotlight task. So in other words, you've got to have pretty quick answers on the, on the hop. So what does the Big Bang Theory state? Because let's face it, you're teaching them for an hour, an hour and a half. You're going to want to move them through this knowledge at a reasonable rate. Okay, everybody stop. Reporters, report back. Share. Question one. What is the Big Bang Theory? What does it state? Okay, and get them to report. Go through it sequentially. This way, you become the sage on the stage. You become the facilitator at the front of the room, and you're bringing the groups together and growing their understanding. Okay, you're exploring the gaps, linking the similarities, you know, and, and facilitating the understanding of the group at large. So you are busily reconstructing knowledge here. Okay, busily reconstructing it for the group, getting them all on the one page. From here, you can blossom it into a role play activity. Now you know what CMBR is, how it was discovered, Pick one of the three scenarios and role play what it might look like. Make sure your role play has details of what CMBR is and how it was discovered. So for instance, you could do an acceptance speech by Penges and Wilson. You could do a court case to Penges and Wilson for animal cruelty for killing the pigeons. Of course, they would defence would be science. A counselling session for Robert Dick for missing out on the Nobel Prize and discovery of CMBR. And and the story is, you know, when you look at the, the stimulus material. Penzias and Wilson and Robert Dick both were shared the same theory, both presented the same findings that year in their journals, both um, were accredited with discovering the, the theory, um, but of course Penzias and Wilson were awarded the Nobel Prize. So a little bit of, you know, here where we broaden the activity, we start to bring in a different range of skills, that vital communication, that, that understanding, that sharing scenario. We could also move into a model of the universe build a 3D model. You know, and how do we do this? We apply our pedagogies. Okay? Think of your narrative here, part one. What is the universe? What is in the universe? You know, have a discussion. Brainstorm what can be seen through a telescope. Define the terms galaxy, planets, distance measures. How do we, you know, how do we measure light years? Part two. How do scientists use models in general to explain and predict phenomena? Discuss the concept of error, this concept of misrepresentation. It's part three, modelling in the group task. Design and assign roles. Give them a time frame, say 30 minutes. They've got to come up with a model, a working model of a galaxy. Break the galaxies down. It could be, you know, we, we have over a billion, 100 billion galaxies. You could select different ones for them, get them to do some research and build a model of it, and then you could explain the differences. Okay, you get them to build um, planet systems or just the solar system. You can limit it, design it, break it up in different tasks, but either way, get them modelling, get them building, group task, get them functioning.
Part four is the sharing. We design a worksheet to enable students to capture sharing. Now, here is often where a science, when inquiry lesson, will fall down. Because, for instance, what are we meant to share? Well, your model looks nothing like mine, so we can't really share this. Um, nonsense. Create a worksheet. On that worksheet, get them to step through various questions. What features of the universe does your model represent? What things does your model misrepresent? What things, or not misrepresent, but you're, you're unsure of? What things about the universe does your model omit or not represent at all? What are your gaps? The gaps in your understanding. And what questions come up as your group worked on the model? So this is the sharing stage where the groups report back and the jigsaw closes. All of the separate pieces come together. Now this, you don't need um, rich resources for this. You can just use modelling clay, paper, balloons, different sized balls or marbles, string, you know, textures, scissors. You can draw them, straws, anything that you think might be useful. But what you must have on hand is your worksheet. This worksheet here, because when you get the students to come back at the end of an inquiry session, you want them to discuss, share and reflect upon their findings. Now, assessment task two does require you to use simulations. I had an email from one student saying, I'm only going to use one simulation because it only appears in one digital card description. Um, please, uh, you were given a range of resources um, and I point again to the New Zealand site. Um, there's a wonderful site too called TED-Ed and I'll talk about it in the Zoom session this week. That's TED.ED. It's a, a digital video resource and on that resource are thousands and thousands of existing lessons. And those video resources are all based on YouTube clips and related clips and they have lessons attached to them and they're all structured and all target different year groups. So when you do your digital card, you don't have to build these resources you simply have to find them. Your task is to create a repository, that is something where you store them. Now the examples on the wiki, oh sorry, on, on the Moodle, um, use Weebly. Now Weebly is a free um, wiki splash blog space, um, free to use, where you can actually just create your own site. It'll be an open site, people can access it, and if you had a class of students, for instance, you'd build your resources in there, put your lessons there, and students would go into your Weebly and, and use it just like a private web page. So other simulations and models, um, go to NASA, have a look. They've got you know, hundreds of simulations and models on the space place nasa.gov menu. You know, and all sorts of things you can build and share in a simple classroom. And they're all age appropriate and they're all task specific and appropriate. Now, in this week's uh, online course, um, on our learning resources this week, we um, have got you looking at the Earth and Space Sciences sections of, of the curriculum for the first time this year. And your tasks vary around the history of the universe, the structure of the solar system, phases of the moon, seasons and eclipse. Part B next week, we're going to look at types of energy, energy sources, renewable and non. So you can see there's a split there between these two. These are more environmental and these, of course, are more space. So we're starting to see the activities you've got listed for you this week. Um, I'll talk in a minute about the timeline. Um, I won't do activity two for you. I mean, I'll encourage you to do that because it's really, really important that you start looking at some of these resources because you can actually just repurpose this in your digital card and use it. Um, the NASA website is good for, for looking at major recent events. Um, there's an online simulator of moon phases. It's really good. Again, it's another simulation that you may want to repurpose into assessment task number two. Activity five, um, describe adaption. Now, we can probably do that from the work we did last week. Um, and of course, the NASA Space Place site is the one I just recommended to you. Um, go there and have a look at a whole range of ac potential activities and simulations that you may include in assessment task number two. Now, with this particular module that I've just presented to you, I mean, how do we measure distance when we start looking at universe and space and in interstellar distances? I mean, toilet paper is a really good way to compare. You know, go back to the first point I made here. Numbers are fabulous things when you were talking about space and space sciences. You know, again, if you can, toilet paper is one of the cheapest ways to, to plot the differences. And of course, you can use digital capture, as we've done here with a photo. And all of a sudden, you've turned your, you know, what is a normal classroom exercise, you're starting to turn it 
into something related to ICTs and information communication technologies where digital cameras are involved you may, may be also with the role play you may be able to do some digital video with that as well um, also with the model you can convert your whole room in, into a, um, a, a, a space um, project and you can have different solar systems on display and students can do a, a poster session um, and they can actually talk and present about their model in, in real time 3D the weekly activities, the astronomy timeline as you see we go back to Aristotle um, and some of the key points um, you know, and discoveries made these will come nicely for you out of Loxley I mean I don't need to talk too much about these um, but the rotating spheres carry moon, planets, suns and stars around the Earth so we've got a geocentric model Ptolemy came up with this first map of the Earth um, and of course it's, if you have a look at Ptolemy's map of the Earth it's, it's um, really interesting it looks like uh, uh, someone spilt some um, baked beans on their t-shirt but have a look at Ptolemy's Earth Centre and see what you think um, for his time it's quite an ambitious construction Copernicus, um, the first heliocentric uh, uh, sun centre um, so he actually reversed previous thinking um, that um, you know the um, the sun rotated around the Earth. Okay, Copernicus actually was the first to, to reverse that sort of thinking. Um, Tycho Brahe, um, planets orbit sun, sun orbits Earth. Kepler, Galileo, Newton, Halley with Halley's comet, of course, and of course the Hubble telescope. And the Hubble, of course, um, and you know the whole notion of redshift how we know that the Big Bang Theory actually comes to exist. Now I'm not going to explain that and that's quite deliberate because I want you to go and work out how the redshift actually indicates um, uh, or supports or endorses the evidence behind the Big Bang Theory and it's got to do with the coloured dots, it's got to do with the heat of the gases um, and I just say to you what we call redshift does indicate distance, distance does indicate um, a hierarchical uh, evolution um, that is an implosion of the Big Bang over time and space um, and so we know for instance that um, you know the universe has evolved and it's ultimately moving towards its end we also know that we can calculate a rough end to, to this explosion um, so it's all fascinating science assessment task number two I'll just point you to these again and we'll constantly keep bringing you back to this um, part A is your professional literature review now earlier in the week I posted you all uh, an email based on some common questions I was getting please have a look at that email it says part A should be polemic that is it should have an introduction a body and a conclusion your introduction should introduce your two pedagogies it should introduce the learners and it should give a brief justification of why you're using each the body can be broken into two parts part one is your first pedagogy where you'll deal with it in detail you provide strategies and examples of it you will explain illustrate and justify how it's used by a teacher part two of that uh, of your body will be your second pedagogy you will describe explain and justify its use in a classroom it will be a different target audience you'll need to discriminate between digital card one audience and digital card two and that will become obvious through your explanations in the body of your paper ultimately you come to your conclusion for part A three parts introduction body conclusion in the conclusion you tell us again what two pedagogies you're using you tell us why you're using them and who your target group is okay so it's really important when the marker and there are seven of us who mark this course when we come to your work you really need to have given us clear instructions about what you're doing what pedagogy one is, what pedagogy two is, who your audience is in pedagogy one, audience pedagogy two. You need to describe, explain, and justify each so that when we go look at your digital card, we can match the evidence of your understanding in that digital card with what you said you were going to deliver in the written part of your assignment. So there are two digital cards, and they should be used to scaffold independent learning okay it's a really important point so I'm going to actually highlight that use to scaffold independent learning in small groups of science in a primary classroom now if you're an ECE teacher clearly one card needs to be for the zero to five learners okay and if you are a primary teacher 
you can do the early years of primary and also the seven to nine of primary. Now the reasons why, let's repeat these. As an early childhood qualified teacher, you could teach in, in preschool centres or you could be asked to teach up to year three in Education Queensland. As a primary qualified teacher, you can teach, for instance, from year zero, foundation year, right through to year nine in a school with Education Queensland. So it's time that we pulled the finger out and actually sort of said to ourselves, all right, at each step in this spectrum, how would I use this technology? How would I apply these curriculum documents? Okay, so it's really important that you, you do that. Do not stick to just one simulation and do not think that by doing a simulation in the primary card that you've ticked that box. We're looking for a rich learning event. That rich learning event must have a clear pedagogy and it must be supported with strategies. Those strategies should include simulations. Okay, simulation is excellent for drill and practice. It's an excellent way to introduce a task. It can be a simple pedagogy and then group work can be a more complex pedagogy. Model building can be a more complex pedagogy, but you should be using simulations. You know, the evidence is here because I keep throwing you simulation examples. That's not a coincidence. That's because we expect to see them in your digital cards. So more examples again, going back. Gregson gives some lists and please, you know, don't try to quote Gregson and, and, and Loxley um, ad nauseum. Um, we had a bit of that with assessment task number one and what people tended to do is reduce, you know, or reduce to the norm and Gregson presents the norm and so if you find yourself citing Gregson a lot, question yourself, go broader. Okay, look at some different resources because chances are, um, you know, Gregson is a fallback position. You know, Gregson offers good ideas but don't rely on Gregson alone. It's, an, it's intellectually lazy and you're going to produce work that looks, you know, a lot like the work that other people are producing. Some other resources, here they are. Think about them. Okay, we've included them for a reason. They are simulation. This New Zealand one is very, very good. Okay, the simulations are quite simple. They're all game-based and they're all done by year-level um, arrangements and groups. All right, now having talked through a lot today, what I'll do on Wednesday in, in the Zoom session is I will piece together a presentation where we'll actually look at uh, some of the resources related to flipping the classroom and how you can do that. Um, assessment task two really is about you coming up with a flipped classroom, a digital card. That digital card your students can work on independently. While they're working independently, you don't go outside and have a sandwich. No, you then engage in the heavy work of constructivist teaching. You sit down with the students, you pick up the people who are falling behind, you help the, the brighter students interrogate and articulate their understandings. You are deconstructing what they understand, you are reconstructing stronger and richer understandings, and you are co-constructing assessment. In other words, they're going to write back to you, either with digital video or with a whole range of different things they could do, they're going to write back to you with their co-constructed understanding based on the group work and the pedagogy and the inquiry that you have put them through. I'll see you on Wednesday at the Zoom session.